Let's ultrasound on today's edition, Ultrasound of the Spleen, Protocol and Measurements. Let's talk a little bit about the location of the spleen in the body. The superior pole of both the kidneys and the spleen are rotated slightly outwards. For the kidneys, this means they form a V shape in the body, and the spleen follows the lie of the left kidney. When imaging the sagittal or coronal spleen or the kidney, it's important to be sagittal or coronal to the kidney or spleen itself, not the body. If you use a traditional sagittal or coronal plane where you're vertical straight up and down, you'll miss the longest eye of the spleen or the kidney. You'll see in the image of the spleen the black line running through it. This is a true representation of a sagittal slice through the spleen rather than a plane that's more sagittal to the body itself. Also, due to where the spleen is located in the body, traditionally we come from a coronal plane to image the spleen because the stomach and gas gets in our way of obtaining a true sagittal spleen image. Another pitfall for imaging the spleen is that the lungs can get in our way, and as a patient breathes, differing amounts of the lung will come down and obscure portions of the spleen. Let's review a protocol for a sagittal or coronal image of the spleen. First, you want to sweep completely through the spleen. And in this plane, the spleen should be the shape of a crescent moon. And you want to take an image of the sagittal or coronal spleen without a measurement, and then a sagittal or coronal spleen image with a length measurement. And this length measurement is going to be the most important measurement when imaging the spleen. A normal spleen measures from 8 to 13 centimeters. You want to measure from the outer wall tip of the spleen to the outer wall tip of the spleen. And you want to exclude the diaphragm and the splenic capsule from the measurement. The splenic capsule is the thin white line that encircles the spleen. And the diaphragm is located along the posterior border of the spleen. And it's a much thinner thicker bright white line. Note that you can have mirror image artifact of the diaphragm because it's such a strong reflector. This means that there will be two copies of this bright white line in the bottom portion of the spleen. Mirror image artifact is an artifact that's caused by the sound waves bouncing off a strong reflector. And in this case, the strong reflector is the diaphragm. And this causes an artifactual carbon copy structure to appear above below or to the side of the strong reflector. In this case, it produces the appearance of two diaphragms or two thick white lines in the posterior margin of the spleen on the ultrasound image. And this second structure is a copy only and is not a real structure. So it's really important in real time that you are carefully evaluating where the bottom border of that spleen is. And if you're visualizing two diaphragms to carefully look in real time and determine where is the true true border of that spleen and which one of those diaphragms is a false diaphragm and is artifact only. And you can do this by carefully looking at the margin of the spleen itself following that rounded contour down below and seeing in real time where does that spleen truly end. This will be a clue to you which one of those diaphragms is false and which one is the true diaphragm. Also, lowering your focus down to this level will help increase the resolution in that region and will also help you determine what is artifact and where the true margins of that spleen lie. When you're measuring from tip to tip in the spleen, it's okay if the measurement line extends through the splenic hilum. You also want to take a sagittal or coronal image of the spleen with color Doppler and you want to demonstrate the vessels entering and exiting the hilum of the spleen and then also a sagittal or coronal spleen image demonstrating the spleen and the left kidney in the same image for comparison. Now let's talk about the transfer spleen protocol and note that this is 
a plane that is 180 degrees opposite the sagittal or coronal splenic plane. Because it's not at a 90 degree angle, it's not a true transverse plane, but we use this as a plane to get around the ribs. You want to sweep completely through the spleen, first of all, and the transducer should be turned 180 degrees from its original sagittal or coronal plane, and the spleen should look like a reverse of the sagittal coronal crescent moon shape. It's going to be a mirror image of the sagittal coronal spleen image. First, you want to take a transverse image of the spleen in this 180 degree plane without a measurement, and then you want to take a transverse spleen image with a depth and a width measurement. A depth measurement is a measurement from the hilum to the splenic capsule, and you want to exclude the hilar vessels and place the caliper on the edge of the splenic parenchyma next to the splenic hilum. You also want to exclude the splenic capsule from the measurement, and the splenic capsule is the thin white line that encircles the splenic parenchyma. Due to either rib shadows or lung across the back end of the spleen, you may need to extrapolate the location of the outer wall of the spleen when it's obscured by ribs or lung artifact. A width measurement is the maximum AP or height dimension. You want to measure the outer wall tip of the spleen to the outer wall tip. You want to exclude the diaphragm from the measurement and the splenic capsule. It's okay if the measurement line extends through the splenic hilum. And note that it's really important that the width and the depth measurements must be perpendicular to one another. Now let's talk about the 90 degree transverse spleen. In a perfect world, this would be the plane that you'd want to capture your transverse spleen images. However, why we don't typically image or perform measurements in the true transverse plane, which is 90 degrees to the sagittal or coronal splenic plane, is due to ribs. Rib shadows obscure much of the parenchyma in a true transverse splenic plane. So to get around these ribs, we rotate the ultrasound probe 180 degrees from the sagittal or coronal plane and use this as our transverse plane. Though, in actuality, it's not a true transverse plane when you're 180 degrees. A true 90 degree transverse plane has a wedge or rounded triangle shape. It is, however, important to go to this 90 degree true transverse plane and carefully sweep through the splenic parenchyma in this plane to ensure that no masses or pathology are being overlooked. And in this transverse splenic protocol, we sweep superiorly and inferiorly to the spleen. And note that this will be exactly 90 90 degrees from the sagittal or coronal plane, and it's going to be transverse to the spleen itself, not transverse to the body. Now let's talk about image optimization for the spleen. First of all is frequency. You want to use the highest frequency that allows you to clearly penetrate and visualize all the way down through the diaphragm at the bottom margin of the spleen. TGC is the next control that needs to be optimized. And you want to ask yourself, is the anterior tip or portion of the spleen darker than the rest of the splenic parenchyma. This is a common mistake when optimizing TGC in the spleen. You want to use the TGC to make the entire splenic parenchyma the same level of brightness throughout. Now let's talk gain. The image is too dark if you cannot see the gray dots of the splenic echo texture. The gain should be set so that the spleen is a medium gray color. The image is too bright if you could not appreciate a hyperechoic mass within the splenic parenchyma. In this ultrasound image of the spleen, this image is optimized with the correct frequency level, TGC, and gain. The next ultrasound control to optimize is the focal zone, and you want to place a solitary focal zone at the level of the posterior parenchyma of the spleen. In this image to the right, the white triangle represents the level where the focus should be placed. 
When optimizing depth for the spleen, you want to ensure that your spleen is the star of the image. And I like to use the one finger rule. Place one finger at the bottom of your ultrasound image. The diaphragm below the spleen should just skim the top of your finger. This helps ensure that you don't have too much depth and that the spleen is not crammed into the near field of the image. This also ensures that you do not have insufficient depth and that a portion of your spleen is either cut off on the bottom of the image or is in danger of being cut off. And note that splenic depth changes sometimes dramatically as a patient breathes in and out. In this image to the right, there's too much depth in the image, which means there's too much empty space at the bottom of that image that could be filled with information about the spleen if the depth was better optimized. Another important optimization fact when performing an ultrasound of the spleen is ensuring that the spleen is not off axis within the ultrasound image. Questions you should ask yourself to determine if you're off axis when you're imaging the spleen. Number one, can you see the anterior tip of the spleen? One of the most common mistakes when first learning to image the spleen is that the spleen is not centered within the ultrasound image and either the anterior tip or the back border of the spleen is cut off in the image. So you wanna ask yourself, can you see that anterior tip? Is your spleen centered in the image? and have you included the maximum amount of the back wall possible? For a sagittal or coronal plane, the spleen should be a crescent moon shape. And for a transverse plane, you should be 180 degrees to the sagittal or coronal plane. And for that transverse plane, your spleen should be a mirror image of the sagittal or coronal image, which will look like a reverse crescent moon shape. You also want to ensure that you can clearly visualize the diaphragm in the posterior portion of the image and that you're visualizing the true diaphragm, not mirror image artifact. In the ultrasound image to the right, the spleen is centered within the image. The anterior tip of the spleen is clearly visualized. You can see the maximum amount of the back border of the spleen. The spleen is a crescent moon shape in this sagittal or coronal plane of the spleen and the diaphragm is clearly visible. This is a properly optimized image of the spleen. Now let's talk about some tips for imaging the spleen. Most of the time you're going to be able to visualize the spleen better with the patient in a supine position. If you cannot visualize the spleen when the patient is in a supine position, then roll your patient into a right lateral decubitus position. Remember that the spleen does not lie in a straight vertical plane in the body. The superior pole of the spleen is rotated slightly outward or laterally in the patient. So you will need to rotate your ultrasound probe slightly in order to capture the longest lie of that spleen. Remember, it's sagittal and coronal to the spleen itself, not the body. Another important point is that the spleen is located way up high and it's tucked up under the ribs. So if you place your probe at the waist level, you are way too low. Also, if you try to come from a true sagittal plane from the front of the body, then the stomach gas is going to obscure the spleen in most cases. Due to the position of the stomach, the spleen is typically imaged from a coronal plane, though this is most commonly still annotated sagittal or long on the ultrasound images. And often you're going to need to move your ultrasound probe more towards the back of the patient in order to visualize the spleen. If you are too far anterior in the body, you may not be able to visualize the spleen. Now let's talk about splenic windows. To image the spleen, our probe is rotated slightly at an angle, and to get different windows for the spleen, we're moving up and down rib spaces with this probe held in a plane that's sagittal or coronal to the lie of the spleen itself. For a transverse plane, you're gonna also be moving up and down rib spaces with the probe held 180 degrees, upside down from the sagittal coronal plane. If the anterior tip of the spleen or the back of the spleen is being cut off in the image, 
meaning that the spleen is not centered in the image, then you want to slide your probe either more towards the patient's front of the body or more towards the back of the body. But most of the time you want to remain in that same rib space and it's just a gentle sliding motion to center that spleen within the ultrasound image. In the ultrasound image shown, this is a transverse spleen with measurements. And note that there's too much depth in this image. The depth is not properly optimized and there's too much empty space at the bottom of the screen. Now let's talk about some breathing techniques that can help when imaging the spleen. There's four breathing techniques that you can use when doing an ultrasound of the spleen. The first technique is stop breathing. You wanna ask the patient to not breathe in or out, but to simply stop breathing and then ask them to hold that and not take a breath in or out. Since the spleen is so close to the lungs, as the patient breathes in and out, the lungs can come down over the splenic parenchyma and obscure portions or all of the spleen. The next breathing technique is to have the patient take a large breath in. So you ask the patient to take a big breath and then hold that breath. Most commonly, this is not going to be a helpful technique when you're imaging the spleen, as most of the time it causes the lung to come down over the spleen, obscuring the spleen. However, in a small number of cases, this is the only way to visualize the spleen. The next breathing technique is to have the patient take a small breath in. And this is usually the most common or most utilized technique when you're imaging the spleen. Ask the patient to take a small breath in and then hold their breath. And the last technique is letting all the breath out. You ask the patient to blow out all their breath and then hold it. And this can be really useful in a patient where the lung greatly obscures the spleen as the patient is breathing. Every spleen lies slightly different in the body. So what works with one patient may turn out to be unhelpful to another patient. So when you're first learning to image a spleen, I suggest trying all four of these techniques until you learn what works with that specific patient. Over time, this will become an instinctual skill and you'll know which technique to use from the start. Now let's talk about splenules. A splenule is an accessory or extra spleen. And you can have no splenules, you can have one splenule, or you can have multiple splenules in the same patient. When visualized, generally the largest splenule is measured in three dimensions. And depending upon the protocol of your site, your site may or may not have you also take a color Doppler image in one plane of the splenule to ensure that there's no torsion of that splenule. Though you're not measuring every single splenule, it's still important to take a few images as you're sweeping through the spleen to document the presence of any additional splenules. Though most commonly in practice, only the largest splenule is going to be measured.